Uh, I think that it's a common experience that grandparents tend to be lax on certain things that, that parents would rather see them be perhaps a little more strict on. If we had any concern what to expect someday from my parents, uh, we've had our confirmation and we're in trouble. Um, through various circumstances, uh, my dog had a sleepover at my parents' house last night, um, which I think is a pretty fair litmus test, right? I mean, if they'll be, you know, what they'll do with a dog, imagine with their own grandkids. Uh, and I'm scared because when I brought food this morning, I ran in to let them know that I had fed her, and Dad said, yeah, she's not going to want to leave. She had steak last night. So if our dog is getting steak, I cannot fathom what the grandkids will get. So I'm concerned. Uh, no, I'm so excited. I say that every time. I mean it every time. I'm so excited to be studying with you this morning. Um, it's always um, so rewarding. Uh, I, it, I'm almost sad that some of you may not ever know what that feel, what that's like, that process, but I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Uh, some of you noticed, I'm sure, my absence Wednesday, and to be quite candid, if you had been able to check on me at the midpoint of this week, you would have found me in an unwell state, and I was laughing with Matthew bef beforehand. 2020 is a bad year for uh, sufferers of seasonal ailments uh, because everyone is at high alert and um, what I know all too well as you know crud from allergies is, is easily presumed to be something much more dire and contagious but I cannot assure you enough that I am uh, by all metrics recovered and would not be here if I did not think so um, Matthew has mentioned more than once over the last couple of weeks about how well the Sunday School lessons have aligned with what the Lord had led him to for the sermons following. Um, and it's a perfect testimony, as it's been said, to how the Spirit moves and works among the body even in ways that we don't necessarily grasp or see um, on the forefront of things. Uh, this week applies much of the same somewhat in reverse. Um, we're going to be in 2 John today, if you want to be turning. Um, and there's a couple places in 2 John to only be 13 verses. Um, there's some opportunities to get lost in the weeds a little bit, but the primary focus of what we're looking at today, interestingly, goes hand in hand with what we've looked at in Galatians. The last time I shared with you all, I discussed um, a known tactic among effective writers or orators having to do with how you structure your content ending on the on the strong stuff um, starting to think I'm just bad at this because I'm out of order again today um, I'm gonna let the fun out a little early and um, tell you straight up before we get started that one of the overarching themes of this letter can be surmised as simply as this be careful to make sure that you maintain an apostolic Christology. I wondered if Major would make a face at me. Yeah. He uh, doesn't hesitate to tell me often to leave the fancy words at home. Our Christology is the subset of our theology that deals with the person of Christ, his nature, 
his role, who he is. And before you run me off and tell me that the church I'm looking for is up the road, that which is apostolic is that which pertains to the apostles. It functions here as an adjective. So what I'm telling you is what we are told here, to be intentional, purposeful, and watchful that we have an apostolic Christology. What I mean is, make sure what you believe about Christ is born of what Scripture says about Christ. Further, what the Apostles' testimony is on the matter. And the reason that I'm, some might say, conflating the two um, is an interesting function of the Apostles. When we look at Apostleship in the New Testament, um, there's a lot of people you couldn't get to say that every book was exhaustively, conclusively written by apostles. But what I think no one can deny is that of the authors we are sure of in the New Testament, no one would deny their apostleship. Just kind of as a feather in your cap, one of the foremost prerequisites of apostleship in the formal sense is having personally seen and interacted with the Christ. So it's interesting that we count on Scripture to guide our understanding of Christ and who He is. And so it's a pretty understandable instruction. Uh, Adobe wants to update, probably not. Understand Christ through what Scripture says. I actually want to start in Galatians. So keep your, your spot in 2 John, and if you would, turn back with me to the first chapter of Galatians. This is sound really familiar. I'm going to start in verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is establishing an orthodoxy. He is marking off a gospel so sacred that if even he, if even an angel would come back and add or subtract in any way that is not aligned with what had been taught, not only don't listen to them, but they should be cursed. I think this is an important backdrop as we now move to Second John and see what John has to say in his letter. I'm going to read the entire letter and then we're going to go through it. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. 
Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. So for me, the first order of business is I want to know who this lady is. Uh, you're going to make a bunch of Southern Baptists uncomfortable. Talk about a lady and talk about her being elect. <laughs> That's a, that could get you in hot water quickly. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. Um, and what's funny is that my study on the matter uh, brought me face to face with the fact that I happen to actually disagree with one of my favorite uh, commentators on this. Um, but I say that to say that I don't see it as a decided issue that anyone has come on, come down on conclusively in any sort of unison. But I'll tell you that I believe that this lady is a sister church. We see language throughout the letter that seems to be dealing with um, a plural subject, um, what we know about the language that the early church used. Um, it seems to me that John is writing to a specific congregation. So that is not the church at large, but a particular fellowship that he was writing to. Um, not everyone holds this opinion, um, but many do. So study for yourself and decide, but I just want you to know that moving forward, that is my understanding of this, that he's referring to a church, a particular body. Um, but also what matters is that who or whatever this lady is does not have changing impact on the message of this letter. Another note that always um, strikes me as interesting from this passage and from similar passages is the exclusivity of the greeting. I want to read the first three verses again. He says, The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us, we will be and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. He's only speaking to Christians when he says that. He says those of us that know the truth. And we could boil it down further and say this is a letter and he's only speaking to this group of Christians, but in, a, in, a, in the broad scope of authorial intent, right, the intent of the author, he's speaking to Christians. That's always interesting to me. I don't know if you've made that distinction. It took a long time for me to make the distinction between how Scripture applies to believers and how Scripture applies to unbelievers. The example I give, my mom um, has a partner in her law office that when they were dealing with a tragedy wanted to um, show their condolences in part in the form of a card and wanted to share scripture with them and I distinctively remember as a young person hearing my parents deliberate over whether or not they should include this verse in this card problem was these people were not secretive about their disregard for church, their disregard for faith. They did not claim to be Christians. They did not lead anyone to believe they were Christians. And so the question that my parents asked, could this promise of comfort from God, this specific example, I don't remember the passage, is it even appropriate to share it with them? Does it apply to them? always interesting to me when we see something that's clearly saying this is to Christians. 
verses 4 through 7 say, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. One of the commentaries I looked at took great lengths to stress that the original language makes clear that these are not, these first verse and sec, the verses four and five are not divergent thoughts, but they're convergent thoughts. It's not a departure, but it builds on it. When he says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, he's not meaning to say only somewhere. Um, the original language seems to imply that of those that he was aware, he did not know of all of them, but of those he was aware, they were walking in truth. And of course, I read that word children as congregants um, in my mind. This idea is supported, in my opinion, by John clarifying that he's not bringing a new command. To me, it's like he's almost saying, because I see you obeying the commandment to walk in truth, I want to remind you of a commandment that's also critical. And man, does it feel timely. On June 14th, 2020, to be reminded of the commandment that we love one another. Verse 6 reiterates this idea that this is not a new teaching. He says, this commandment is just as you have heard from the beginning. Verses 7 and 8 say, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. And then verse 8 says, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. These verses feel like a minefield. <laughs> um, and believe me, if you don't know me well enough, ask people who have known me a long time, it's not so much that I'm scared to dive headfirst into uh, difficult passages. <laughs> um, if anything, I'm too willing and at times I'm not even looking to be profitable, I just want the debate. Um, but when I was preparing, I was overwhelmingly convicted that I shouldn't linger. And I think there's a danger to being so speculative and so heady about things that your faith can start to lack substance. And if I'm honest, I have had to repent thinking that as long as I'm deliberating on these issues, as long as I'm wrestling with them in some vacuum of academia, that I don't have to do anything about it. I'm going to hide behind these things. But the question's there. What does it mean that anyone who does not confess the coming of the Christ is the Antichrist? What does it mean that we may not, <laughs> we may not lose what we worked for? That we win a full reward? And so the question that I was asked as I studied, do I have some uncertainty about the moral position of the Antichrist? Am I unclear on where I should want to stand in relation to the Antichrist? Do I not want a full reward? And so forgive me for oversimplifying, but my answer, verse 9 says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. I wanted so badly. When Matt told me, <laughs> when Matt told me, hey, will you teach, well, that's, this is a question. So I guess when Matt asked me, will you teach Second John? 
was standing right back there. Some of you all were there. What did I say? I said, cool. I get to deal with the perseverance of the saints. I was convicted for that this week as I was studying. Abide in the teaching of Christ. One of the most important features of this truth about the Christ in flesh is found in a verse that begins very similarly to verse 6. Verse 6 begins, and this is love. This sounds very similar to a verse we've heard recently because it's from 1 John. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. There are two critical pieces of truth about Christ in this verse. There's this great love that we see but not just how great the love is, but how costly the love is for the Father. When I think back to the very first example of Satan's efforts against man, and I ask myself, has anything really changed? I've heard a lot of preachers call alcohol the devil's favorite tool. I think the modern example would probably be pornography But with all due respect, I dissent a little. Satan has always worked by bringing into the question the issue of sin. Is it really a sin? Or will there really be consequences for sin? You cannot abide in the teaching of Christ come in flesh if you do not deal with sin and how it necessitated that Christ would come as a sacrifice. There have been a lot of incendiary things said over the past few weeks. And I'm about to say something that would be considered by many to be controversial. And for one of the first times in my life, I'm not necessarily looking forward to it. But as I spent time considering what it means to live in the truth of the teachings of Christ and that Christ came in the flesh and all the implications that follow, I've become convinced This nation does not have a problem with racism. This nation does not have a problem with wealth inequality. This nation does not have a problem with overdue social reform. This nation has a problem with sin. The problem is, and here's the danger, I'm afraid, of trying to maneuver around the issue of sin in our nation. When we say that it's an issue of racism, that is man against man, and the answer comes from man. We reform his heart towards his brother, and he corrects his behavior, and the issue is no more. When we make the issue wealth inequality, we say we redistribute, we take from those that have too many, and we give to those that don't have enough, and we've solved the problem. When we teach that what we need is social reform, we say we correct these behaviors, we indoctrinate a new generation with this reform, and we've solved the problem. What has never been the message of the Christ in flesh is that the answer lies in us. The problem lies in us. We have wicked hearts. The answer was in Christ in flesh. 
What about the other thing we do? Oh, well, Jesus would have, oh, well, Jesus would probably say here, I heard it said so well this week, Jesus didn't come to take positions. Jesus came to take over. Jesus is not relegated to your political position. You want the truth of Christ. Jesus didn't come to conquer civil unrest, and he wasn't a social reformer. He came to conquer death, hell, and the grave, and he reforms the wicked heart of man. I am concerned. We think we know. And how often, I've heard it said so many times, well, don't find a devil in every bush. We sell short the efforts of Satan. And I have always believed that Satan does not deal in the obvious. We look for Satan in pentagrams and sacrificed goats. That's laughable. Satan deals in nine-tenths of the truth. He wants just enough similarity to what's authentic to convince you that you're okay, but he pollutes it in the end. It is amicable to want to see our nation in a position where people are not mistreated for physical attributes. But the issue is not that man needs to be taught and needs to turn inwardly and correct himself. The issue is that he must be made a new creation. Verse 10 and 11 say, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Nate, I'm going to borrow something from you. (laughs) I'm not entirely sure what to do with this. I'm just not settled on it. Couldn't get settled on it. That's strong. It's reminiscent of language that tells us to knock the dust off of our sandals and continue on into another city. It's reminiscent of language of not giving your blessing to a household based on how they receive you. And I don't know that I fully understand how to work through those instructions either. But I tell you what, while I'm still sorting it out, I'm going to err on the side of caution. And so I want you to know something. If you want to talk about the obvious need for change in our nation, I'm with you. If you want to have a conversation with me about what needs to happen, I want to listen. But if you are not starting foundationally on our dire need that every man, woman, and child needs to come to know the redemptive, renewing, regenerate work of Christ in their lives, I love you. I don't want to talk to you. It's sad. It can't even be funny. It's so sad how divisive this issue has been. On both sides, we are so quick to focus on tertiary issues. Hearts will be renewed or nothing will change. What we saw happen a couple weeks ago, what we see happen 
every time this comes up, is a sinful man meets a sinful man and sin happens. There's nothing political about that. Matt has talked, I don't know at what points I've been around him so long, it's starting to run together, about how it's so interesting that Christmas has seen commercial success in a way that still affords some of the Christian symbols to remain in it. We still do nativity scenes, they're becoming more controversial, but we still allow them generally there's something about Christ in Christmas that still remains, but what has been totally commercialized and leaves no room for its religious implications is Easter. There is very little offense in a baby. That's easy to digest. That's, that's not hard to wrestle with. What's hard to grapple with is the idea that you are so wicked that God's perfect son had to die for your sake so that you would not spend eternity under the judgment of God for your wickedness. Somehow that just doesn't have the same ring to it. The truth of Christ coming in flesh is dealing with why he had to come. And so I'm going to let it go. I don't want to be a broken record. But there is so much dialogue right now about what needs to happen. And you're kidding yourself if you're starting anywhere else but the issue of sin. The letter closes out. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. I'm going to take a lot of liberty here, and I mean a lot. John would prefer not to use paper and ink. He'd prefer to something face to face. Here's, here's, I'm taking my liberty. Get off Facebook. <laughs> this is a 23-year-old kid telling a bunch of adults that, okay? My phone has been tore up for the past couple of weeks. And now that I'm married, I'm a grumpy man of the house, and bills cost a lot, and life's expensive, and so I'm mad at how much phones cost. Never had to worry about that before. I was in this safe bubble of my parents' home. Now I have to worry about it. And I'm mad about it, and so I'm being stubborn, I'm not buying a new phone. What that means is I've been without one this whole time. It's been a couple weeks now. I've had an impromptu hiatus from social media as a result. And it has really changed my perspective. I mean this, I'm not being funny, I'm not setting up the joke, I mean this. I'll tell you what it's helped me see, I mean, more plainly. I mean, this is the longest I've gone without a phone in a decade. I'm in that generation. Facebook is the biggest collection of misinformation and stupid nonsense I've ever seen. And I had to step out of it to see it. And you remember, I'm saying this, I've been to college, so I've seen stupid nonsense, okay? I paid to see it. That's the sick joke of it. There is nothing edifying for me on Facebook. And, I, and I, listen, I'm, I mean this, I don't doubt that some of you more mature than me have found ways to participate responsibly. And I concede that to you, but for me personally, I'm just giving my testimony, there's nothing for me on it. It makes me angry every time I get on, and there is nothing profitable in that.
what I see on Facebook is Satan successfully turning people against each other as they chase after the wrong thing. What I don't see on Facebook are people dealing with the issue of sin. And I'm picking on Facebook. It applies in broad strokes. I love y'all. I feel it's important to say that. And I could never deny how much you all love me and show me love. And I appreciate that. I think in this church, we follow this command well. We love one another. So discouraged by what we are watching. So discouraged. But this letter challenges me, reminds me that if I'm not careful, I will sink into the mud of what's happening and I will lose the truth of the only possible solution. May we stay true to the teaching of Christ come in flesh. The truth of Christ come in flesh is that he was the propitiation for my sin. Let's pray. Lord, my country is hurting. This nation is being torn. And Lord, if that wasn't sad enough, looking around, we are doing everything but the one thing we could do to fix it. Lord, forgive me. I harbor anger towards my brothers and sisters for things they say. Lord, I pray that you would just shut my mouth up. If I'm not going to boldly stand in the truth of Christ, in the truth of our sin, shut my mouth up. I have nothing else to contribute. I thank you for the love of this congregation. I thank you that we love each other Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to continue to turn outwardly with that love. That we would not concern ourselves with being seen as right or winning arguments, but Lord, that we would be totally obsessed with winning souls. Remove the other stuff from our lives. I'm so unfit. I myself am so sinful. I have not found the bottom of your mercy yet. Lord, forgive me. Hold me to these things. As I say them, this congregation would see me walking in them. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather. As we continue in worship, Lord, prepare our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would find our worship acceptable. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.